Friends, I'd ask for your complete attention whilst the choir sings Bilvavi. Friends, I want to welcome you all here today to the National Yom HaShoah, an event, an event in which we come together as one in so many ways. We come together with the support of the whole United Kingdom Jewish community with the aim of renewing the pledge that the Shoah would have a permanent place in our communal and personal memories and that we would come together to pay tribute to all its victims. By your attendance here today, and this is the largest attendance that we've ever had here at the Dell, each of you has renewed that pledge, and I thank you for that. Each year on Yom HaShoah, Jewish communities all over the world pause, reflect, and remember the unique events of the Holocaust. And today, we come together as one to remember our own loss in our own way. Unlike the outward-looking Holocaust Memorial Day on the 27th of January, 
a national event which has become ever more embedded in our national life since its inception in the United Kingdom in 2001, Yom HaShoah is introspective. It's more personal for us as Jews and an event which given the resurgence of anti-Semitism here and across the world is even more important for us because it shows where anti-Semitism can lead. It is our day, but I'm also very pleased to welcome many distinguished guests from outside our community who have joined us to mark this very special occasion, including diplomatic representatives of many countries. Today is when we come together as a community to mourn our loss, to tell the story, and to remember the six million who would all have chosen life, but who had that choice taken away from them in the most brutal of ways. So today we will focus on lost communities and untold stories to ensure that the vibrant life of those communities which are gone forever are not forgotten, and to ensure that those untold stories are told and repeated so that they become known and that they enable us to renew our pledge that all the victims of the Holocaust will not be forgotten. We always say each year, and it's as true this year as ever in the past, that we come together for three reasons. One, to remember, two, to reflect, and three, to renew that very special pledge, not only to ourselves, but to the murdered six million of our people. And we remember in a number of different ways. We will reflect in our traditional way. We will honor our survivors and refugees, but above all, we join together because we owe it to each of those six million that their memories live on. We begin with the Yad Vashem law, we commune, and I now ask the President of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, Mary van der Zyl, to come forward. Friends, this is my first Yom HaShoah commemoration as the Board of Deputies President, and it is an honor for me to open today's ceremony. But I'd first of all like to thank the organizers of the event, chaired by Neil Martin, who have worked so hard to enable us to come together today. It is so important for us as a community to remember the millions who were murdered in the Holocaust and to reflect on those in our own families. I lost many of my own family and my grandfather only survived because he made it onto one of the kinder transport and made it safely to this country. The events of the Holocaust are still in living memory, although there are fewer and fewer survivors every year. But the recent events in Christchurch, Sri Lanka, San Diego, and Pittsburgh powerfully demonstrate that anti-Semitism and violent religious hatred are still claiming lives to this day. It is up to all of us to ensure that the world is reminded of the horror of the Holocaust. In that way, we both honor the victims and ensure their stories will continue to be heard. Next year will mark the 75th anniversary of the end of the Shoah. And Yom HaShoah UK are embarking on a new legacy initiative with major plans underway, including the return of a large-scale stadium event on Erev Yom HaShoah next year. This will be on the 20th of April, 2020. The first part of the Legacy Project is being launched today. You will find, with your program, a legacy card describing the mission and guiding you on how you can help preserve the memory. 
which by next year will have been distributed to every synagogue, school and youth organisation. This will run alongside and complement the Maccabi GB Yellow Candle Initiative, each candle honouring the individual memory of a victim that perished in the Shoah. It is now my honour as President of the Board of Deputies to officially open today's Yom HaShoah commemoration with the reading of the Yad Vashem law. We commune. On the 27th of Nisan, Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Day, we commune with the memory of the six million members of our nation who perished as tormented martyrs at the hands of the Nazis and their helpers. Of the communities and families of the House of Jacob that were destroyed and obliterated in a malevolent scheme to eradicate the name and civilization of Israel from under heaven. We remember with respectful awe the fortitude of our brethren who gave their lives for their people in sanctity and purity. The sublime valor of those quarantined in the ghettos and of the fighters who rose and kindled the flame of rebellion to redeem their people's honor. The lofty, relentless struggle of the Jewish masses for their humanity and Jewish civilization. And the righteous among the nations who save Jews at the risk of their own lives. My name's Rebecca Lewis, and I'm here representing the Union of Jewish Students. I returned from March of the Living 2019 on Friday, and myself, together with 300 other UK participants, were lucky enough to be joined by survivors of the Holocaust as we learnt about Jewish life in Poland before, during, and after the Holocaust. On Yom HaShoah, we marched from Auschwitz I to Auschwitz-Birkenau with 11,000 other people from around the world. We marched on Yom HaShoah to celebrate life. This incredibly moving and enriching experience taught me that we must remember today, tomorrow, and every day after the atrocities of the Holocaust, so we ensure never, ever again. The full name for our communal remembrance day is Yom HaShoah Vehagavura, which translates as the day of remembrance of the Holocaust and the heroism. The original Hebrew date chosen to mark Yom HaShoah was to fall on the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising to remind us that it is not only important to remember the victims of the Holocaust, but to also pay tribute to its Jewish heroes and their many acts of bravery, bravery and often martyrdom. 76 years ago, on the 19th of April, 1943, on the eve of Pesach, the Germans entered the Warsaw Ghetto, intending to begin the final liquidation. They were met with fierce resistance. In response to earlier deportations, several underground organizations had formed. The Jewish Combat Organization and the Jewish Military Union worked together to oppose attempts to destroy the ghetto. They obtained weapons, not much in comparison to the Nazis' weaponry, but weapons all the same. Armed with pistols and small explosives, for four weeks, these resistance movements fought back, resisting with all they had and stalling the Nazi plans to liquidate the ghetto. Despite the incredible bravery of those in the ghetto, on May 16, 1943, the Germans brutally ended the uprising. 7,000 Jews died fighting or hiding in the ghetto during the four-week uprising. In his final letter before he was murdered, the leader of the uprising, Mordechai Anilevitz, wrote, I feel that what we have dared to do is of enormous significance. The dream has been fulfilled. Jewish self-defense in the ghetto has become a fact. Jewish armed resistance and revenge 
has become a reality. I have been witness to the magnificent, heroic fighting of Jewish men in battle. News from the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising quickly spread and inspired poet and partisan Hirsch Glick to write the lyrics, Zognit Kenmo, never say this is the final road for you. Zognit Kenmo became an anthem of defiance. Jewish partisans in the forests and ghettos of Lithuania, Belarus, and Poland sang this song to fortify their courage and to celebrate their victories against the Nazis. We are privileged to hear the partisan song be performed today. Like many of you, I participated in the outstanding Yellow Candle Initiative. For your mashallah, I lit my candle in memory of Naftali Weber, who died in Yanov at the tender age of five. I had a name and a place. Every time I visit Yad Vashem in Jerusalem and I enter into the impressive hall of names, there is one thing that I notice above all others. There in that imposing circular structure, you find shelves upon which there are files of the names of the victims of the Sha'ah, and above them thousands of photographs of victims taking you up to the domed ceiling above. But there are empty shelves 
It's so noticeable. These are the shelves that are waiting for names. And the reason is that despite the best of professional efforts over the years to amass all the names of the victims of the Shah, nonetheless, we only have in our possession 4.7 million names. 1,300,000 victims are unknown to us. Sometimes we have names, but no places of death. For example, when family members were snatched from their homes, often brutally and mercilessly in the presence of their mishpacha, it was known that they were taken to their deaths, but we don't know where they actually died and where their remains are. Sometimes just the opposite is the case. We know of a place of death, but we don't know the names. We had an example of this earlier this year on the 20th of January when it was the privilege of our community to bury the remains of six victims of the Shah who perished in Auschwitz. We know where they died, but we had no clue about their identity. And sometimes you have no names and no places. We just have a number of people who perished. That's because there were some entire towns and villages which were absolutely decimated without leaving a single survivor. No person who could emerge to tell the stories of those people, their lives, and how they went to their deaths. No survivors who could record stories of heroism and of outright faith till the last breath. And there were also concentration camps and genocide centers and forests in which horrific atrocities took place, but nobody was able to escape from them. And as a result, we hardly even know their names to this day. All those highlights for us, the depth of the cruelty and the enormity of the crime of the Holocaust. The prophet Isaiah brings to us the word of God. With regard to Jewish martyrs, God promises, I will place for them within my home and within my walls an everlasting memorial. The prophetic term for a memorial is Yad Vashem, which literally means a hand and a name. This brings us enormous comfort. God speaks about the name of the person who has been a martyr. So even though these names are not all known to us here on earth, in heaven above, God knows their names. Their identities are known to Him. And He gives us His promise that they reside amongst the holy and the pure in the higher celestial spheres above in the presence always of God. With regard to all those names lost to us forever, no Kaddish has ever been recited with them specifically in mind. No Yizkor has ever been said with their names mentioned. But God tells us that He remembers them forever. Their souls reside with Him. But there is also the term Yad, hand. You see, the hand is the most active part of the human body. A hand is a symbol of action, and this is a call to us to act, to guarantee that all that which transpired during the Shah should never happen again. It is for this reason that we welcome the intention to act, as stated by our government, supported by all political parties in the Palace of Westminster to establish a United Kingdom Holocaust Memorial Fund outstanding iconic memorial and learning center in the best possible location, Victoria Tower Gardens. And we look forward to the fulfillment of this aspiration. And it is for this reason as well, deriving our inspiration from the term Yad Hand, 
that all of us within our society must be determined for the sake and in memory of and to memorialize the victims of the Shah, those whose names are known to us and those whose names are not, to ensure that we will stamp out anti-Semitism once and for all. Eufen Pripaji brennt a fire, und im Stub is heiß. Und du rebeleren kleiner Kinderlach, dem Aleph beis. Und du rebeleren kleiner Kinderlach, dem Aleph beis. Seht sche Kinderlach. The Gensche Tire, was he learned, such a noch a mol und take noch a mol, come it's alle froh, such a noch a mol und take noch a mol, come it's alle To be quite honest with you, from the age of eight, this was the happiest part of my life. I used to get 110 kroners pocket money, and I would spend most of the money of tickets to the opera, which I absolutely loved. The town itself was a beautiful place, but the opera house and the theater were extraordinary. I would go there with my boyfriend. He introduced me to it. But remember, we stood right at the top. Otherwise, our money would have been spent much quicker. To this day, I am a very keen opera lover. I love the music and the romantic arias are just incredible. Verdi, Puccini, they are amazing. I know every one of them. Eva Beha, born Romania, 1925. I had a happy childhood. As an only child, I was spoiled and indulged. Uh, I must have been one of the most photographed babies in the country, taken to professional photographers practically every week of the first years of my life. My parents must have loved me very much. I have happy memories of playing with them and being taken out by them. Novisad is on the banks of the Danube with a sandy beach, and I remember going swimming in the Danube in the summer. There are photos of us there in 1943 and 1944, in a family photo album. Ivan Shaw, born in Yugoslavia in 1939. My mother used to love dressing me as a Bavarian peasant boy when I was little. One day on holiday, I was playing by the paddling pool in my lederhose. I was the only child with a swimming doll that could actually do the crawl when wound up by its arms. I bent down too low and I fell into the water. 
I was so stunned that I just stayed sitting there until some lady told my sister, who as usual was engrossed in a book, that her little brother had fallen into the water. Little brother, my sister was thinking. Oh, could she mean my sister? I shall never forget the squelching sounds of my leather boots made at each step as I was walked back to the hotel and put to bed. Margaret Stern, born in Germany, 1925. We lived in a very nice flat in the center of Vienna with my maternal grandparents. Well, obviously we were, we were Jewish, but very much assimilated, and religion played very little part in my childhood, although we did belong to a synagogue. As far as friends were concerned, some were Christian, others were Jewish. It, it, it made no difference. I was doing very much the same as, as other children. I regularly went to the playgrounds and to the parks. I was invited to other people's and other children's homes, and of course they were invited to us. Religion was immaterial, but it was all quite normal. I thought at the time that that's how, how life is and how it would go on. I had no suspicion of what was to come. But even as a very young child, I heard parents talking about a man called Hitler. But he was a very nasty man, but nothing to worry about because, because he was in Germany and we were in Austria. And Austria was a very different country from Germany. George Falcon, born Austria, 1929. <laughs> Komm jetzt alle froh, sorg schön noch einmal und tag in noch einmal, komm jetzt alle I was born in 1937 in Wodawa on the Polish-Ukraine border. My grandfather was a merchant and traded with the Poles both in Wodawa and the outlying villages. My aunt and uncle lived in the same house with my cousin Shlomo, who sadly was both deaf and mute. Everything changed when the Germans came. Wodawa filled up with Jews fleeing from elsewhere. My grandfather was not allowed to trade, and there were curfews. It was rumored that there were two camps going to be built nearby, one at Sobibor, a death camp, and the other a work camp in a small nearby village called Adampol. With this in mind, my father and grandfather took whatever valuables they had, and went to see the farmer who owned the land, whom they knew well, and begged him to do what he could to protect Shlomo and I. He confirmed the rumor. Everyone from Wodava, men, women, and children, old and young, walked to Adampol. In Adampol, there was no running water, no electricity, no sanitation. In the camp, there were sheds with bunk beds. That's the best way I can describe them. Surrounded by barbed wire. And there was a watchtower. And there was also a well that served the village. 
at the initial selection, the farmer requested that my father, that my mother, myself, and Shlomo be allocated to work in his home and farm. As the farmer was a bachelor, his niece Zosha, her husband, her and her daughter lived with him and helped him run both the farm and the house. My mother worked for the farmer, both in the house and the fields. I helped in both the house and the fields and looked after Shlomo as best I could. Zosha did not like us, and my mother was terrified of her. After a time, another niece called Salah arrived. She was kind to us and made life more bearable. I will never forget the day I lost Shlomo. We were hiding in a barn. I dived into the hay, but he didn't. The Germans found him crouching on the floor, and I never saw him again. My father managed to escape from the work camp and joined the partisans in the nearby fields, woods. In the last winter of the war, I got very sick probably with typhus, which was rife. My mother asked Salah whether just for one night we could sleep on the floor in the kitchen by the stove, and she agreed. Sometime during the night, there was a persistent knock on the kitchen window. My mother got up and opened it, and there was my father. It was a quick conversation. He said, you must come. There is an action tomorrow. My mother would not leave because I was ill. The next morning, the Einsatzgruppen arrived. There were shouted orders, barking dogs, and my mother and I were just lying on the pellet and listening. Suddenly, there was a bang on the door. My mother very calmly got on her knees, put her arms around me, and gave me a kiss and went out. When she didn't return, I opened the door and stood, and stood on the doorstep and looked for her. She was being lined up with others in front of a well. As I was deciding whether to go and hold her hand as I often did, an order was given and they began to shoot. I saw her fall and I saw the blood on the snow, and I knew that I must not make a sound, and I knew why she did not look at me. Life in the camp carried on, and I continued to work in the fields and sleep at the shed. People in the camp were kind to me. I gradually recovered from my illness. The Russians liberated us in 1945. The war was over, and people began to come out of hiding, and out of the woods, but no one came for me. The mind is a wonderful thing. I even persuaded myself in those bitter, lonely months, after I witnessed my mother's execution, that she was still alive, and that my father, who had been there the night before, had carried her away and that we would be together again one day. My mother would look after me, make me clean, cook me food, and make the past better. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly my father appeared. Skinny and in rags, he must have walked for miles. We remained in the camp for a while and then returned to whatever moved on to Lublin, and finally ended up in Łódź. My father made a sort of, some sort of living as a black, black marketeer with a Russian partner. In a strange way, those months and years after our liberation were in their own way as traumatic as the war. I was lifted out of a trench by a Russian, and then the Russians moved on and abandoned us. My grandfather's two sisters had both settled in England, 
and after the war, my, ma my father made contact with them. And although he was not allowed to leave Poland, I was allowed to go on a student's vi visa. Some of the most important things hap in life happen by accident. Basil, now Lord Feldman, was a friend of the family in England. One of my grandfather's sister's son <laughs> knew Basil Feldman, who was at that tri time trading in Poland. The son told him that they were trying to get their great niece out of Poland and volunteered together with his partner to look us up. And that is how it started. And it was only because they were trading with Poland that I got a visa. I arrived in England on the 31st of January, 1949. I went to live with my great aunt and uncle. My father managed to get a visa for Israel and I don't, did not see him again until 1958 when my grandfather died. I was always haunted by the memory of the well, and it was only many years later, in 1985, when I returned to Adampol, that I found the well. And I knew that I had not imagined this. It had happened the way I remembered it. I knew it, that it happened because I was there. My father and I were the only survivors of our entire family. This, is seven, this year is 70 years since I arrived in Great Britain, which gave me a home and security. I found a country of tolerance and respect for others. It is my sincerest wish that society continues to remember the horror, horror of the Holocaust so that with respect and tolerance, it can never happen again.
now come to the candle lighting ceremony. Each candle will be lit by three, sometimes more people, each one of the three representing one particular aspect of our stories. So the first candle will be lit by Susan Bernange, a second, third or fourth generation member in memory of the families Obuchowski and Rosenblatt, joined by Mr. Michael Goldstein, the president of the United Synagogue, and survivor Kurt Marx. He came here on a kinder transport, but both of his parents were killed in Malay Trotinik, one of the lesser known camps that the chief rabbi referred to earlier. We light this candle to honor those who managed to survive the darkest hours of our history. For the second candle, we have Stephen Nelkin in memory of Ida Nelkin, Rosa Nelkin, Paula Nelkin, Max Nelkin, Julius Nelkin, members of his family, accompanied by Rabbi Joseph Dweck, the senior rabbi of the Sephardi community, and Rachel Levy, a survivor of the camp of Auschwitz. We light this candle in memory of all the innocent victims, whether Jew or Gentile, who perished at the hands of the Nazis in the days of the Holocaust. The third candle will be lit by Brian Bloom in memory of lost communities and in particular the 27 members of the Scher family from Lithuania, accompanied by Mr. Leon Newmark, a senior trustee of the Federation of Synagogues, and Marla Tribich, a survivor of bergen belsen We light this candle to ensure the never-ending memory of those innocent victims killed in the Shoah. For the fourth candle, we have Shoshana Hoffman in memory of Paula and Bernard Hoffman accompanied by Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg, the senior rabbi of Mazorti Judaism, and Ziggy Schipper, Order of the British Empire Medal, survivor of Auschwitz. We light this candle to honor the righteous Gentiles who risked their lives in attempts to save the Jews of Europe. will be lit by Mr. Andrew Kaufman in memory of Carl Philip, Jeffrey Marx, the chairman of the Movement for Reform Judaism, and Monique Blake, who was a hidden child in France. We light this candle to honor the memory of the one and a half million children murdered by the Nazi tyranny. The last candle is lit by Councillor Eva Greenspan in memory of Ulla and Roman Weisberg with 
Rabbi Dr. Andrew Goldstein, the President of Liberal Judaism, and Sir Ben Helfgott, member of the Order of the British Empire, President of Yom HaShoah UK, and a camp survivor of Buchenwald and Theresienstadt, and Angela Cohen, Chair of the 458 Society, to remember the families of the 732 boys. And we light this candle for the lost communities and the lost generations and what they would have brought to the world in art, in science, in medicine, and all walks of life, all lost. I'd invite you all to stand, please, for the memorial prayer, which will be sung by cousin Johnny Turgill. For many of us who were here last year, will we remember that the survivor who spoke was Johnny's late grandmother, the wonderful Gina Turgill. And it's fitting that Johnny sings Kel Mole Rachamim today.
Adonai hu nachalatam ve'anuchu ve'shalom. על משכבם ונאמר אמן. Please join me in reciting Kaddish. יתקדל ויתקדש שמי רבה. על מה דברך ירותי וימליך מלכותי בחייכון וביומכון ובחיי דכל בית ישראל בעגלה ובזמן קריב ואמרו אמן. יהי שמי רבו מברך לעולם עולמי עולמיה יתברך וישתבח ויתפאה ויתרמם ויתנשא ויתהדה ויתעלה ויתהלל שמי דקודשה ברכו לעילה מנכל בחטא ושירתה, תשבחתה ונחמתה, תאמרם בעלמא ואמרו אמן. יהי שלום הרבה מן שמיא, וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן. עושה שלום במרמור, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן. There are many silences in Judaism. There is a silence of grief, the Edom Maharon, our own silence when his sons died. There is a silence of trauma, the Mati Lo Efacht Pi, when there are no words to express how we feel. There is a silence of the victims, the words, the prayers that they, didn't, that they did not live to say. There is a silence of death. And then there is a silence of memory, as we remember those who we have lost. Nefesh achat kul olam malay. One life is like a universe. Tonight, we remember six million lost universes, a whole murdered generation. If we were to stand in silence for one minute for each victim of the Shoah, we would have to remain silent for 11 and a half years. Let us now stand. Remember and be silent. Please be seated. Seeing Hitler's rise to power in the 1930s, many members of Britain's Jewish community were gravely concerned over the plight of German Jewry. Following Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass in November 1938, organizations like the Jewish Lads and Girls Brigade, JLGB, an organization I'm proud to represent today, were now determined to take practical action to help refugees settle in Britain. The Central British Fund for German Jewry, now called World Jewish Relief, 
managed to persuade the British government to allow the CBF to mount two rescues of Jews from Greater Germany. The first of these rescues of 10,000 unaccompanied children is well known as the Kinder Transport. The second rescue is less well remembered and documented. Between February 1939 and the outbreak of World War II on 3rd of September 1939, just under 4,000 adult Jewish refugees, all of them men, were put on trains from Berlin and Vienna. In the Netherlands, they boarded boats to British and eventually made their way to Sandwich in East Kent, where the CBF had rented an old First World War base known as Kitchener Camp, which JLGB agreed to run. Jonas May, the then JLGB chief executive, was seconded and appointed director of the Kitchener Camp, and his brother Phineas May, also a JLGB officer and a talented artist, became the welfare and entertainment officer and editor of the monthly Kitchener Camp Review. The Kitchener Camp was known for its efficient organisation and collectivist ethos. By mid-1939, the camp was filled to capacity and buzzing with educational and cultural activities. Among the residents were doctors, lawyers, professors, scientists and musicians. The camp boasted a library, a cinema, an orchestra, a dance band, a string quartet and a choir. The JLGB loaned a portable synagogue to the camp so the refugees could attend services. The camp chaplain was, doctor, was Rabbi Dr. Werner van der Zyl, who was a refugee himself, and also, I say proudly as I stand before you all today, my great-grandfather. In December 1939, after the outbreak of war, the Kitchener men were encouraged to join the Pioneer Corps, an unarmed section of the British Army. The large majority enlisted and most formed part of the British Expeditionary Force to continental Europe. When France fell in June 1940, it was thought too risky to keep a group of German-speaking refugees or enemy allies, as they were known, so close to the English Channel and the ports. Subsequently, Kitchener Camp, as a refugee camp and as a pioneer corps training camp, was closed down. Some 4,000 4, men passed through the Kitchener Camp during the 18 months that it was open. And as we know, a further 10,000 children were rescued from Nazi Europe as part of the more well-known kinder transport. Britain can be proud of these rescue efforts, while at the same time we mourn all of those who were not allowed onto those trains and boats. For many, the joy of finding safety in Britain was tempered by the loss of loved ones they would never see again. Hello, my name is Monica Lohenberg. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I am deeply honored and also very moved. My late father, a former Berlin alt boy, Ernest Lohenberg, who spoke to many of you at the 2012 Yom HaShoah, was a German Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany. If it had not been for the kindness of Ort, he would never have got out of Germany and like most of the Levenbergs, would have perished in the Nazi death camps or in the Riga ghetto. From the 6th of February 1939, the Council for German Jury discussed how to get the Berlin Ort School boys and their teachers out of Nazi Germany and to Britain. There were many delays due to financial matters that needed to be arranged among Berlin, the British government and British funding bodies. On the 1st of May 1939, an agreement was finally reached on the funding. But then, the Nazis put a spanner into the works and refused to have the school equipment removed and transferred to England, equipment which had been purchased on behalf of the British Ort. Procedures to transfer the Berlin Ort students and their teachers ground to a halt. It appeared that the transfer would never happen. That is, until Colonel Levy of British Ort stepped in. Levy went to Berlin to obtain permission to transfer the students and teachers to England, 
without the equipment, but with Adolf Eichmann's personal consent. In literally the last hour, a total of 106 boys between the ages of 15 to 17, with eight instructors and their families, left Berlin for England August 27, 39, 80 years ago. They had intended to leave on the 26th of August, but even that transfer had been delayed on the day. But the following day, the 27th of August, 1939, they left. The transport was one of the last transports out of Nazi Germany. A further transfer for the remaining 100 odd ort boys who were younger and the school's director, Dr. Werner Simon, was planned for the 3rd of September, 1939. However, 3rd of September, 39, war broke out. The majority of this group, including Dr. Werner Simon, perished in Auschwitz. The Ort school boys who got out on the first transport were the last internees to be given a safe haven at the Kitchener camp, an old and run-down World War I training base situated in Richborough near Sandwich in Kent. The boys arrived in Britain on the 29th of August, 39. They spent two days in a Salvation Army hostel in London where they were struck by the incredible kindness they received from strangers, Jewish and non. Loaded with gifts of food on the 1st of September, the Ort boys moved to the Kitchener camp. They had been saved, literally, in the nick of time. In the Kitchener camp, Ort's boy Gerd Wolf recalled the following. There were approximately 40 cottages with around 3,600 refugees. All sorts of professions were represented. For instance, mechanics, watchmakers, cobblers, suitcase makers, photographers, and carpenters. And either people worked in the workshops, or they worked in the kitchen, or in road construction, or otherwise in the sanitary departments of the camp. The work hours were from 8 to 12, and then from 1 to 4, and after that, free time but it's probably an exaggeration to call it free time since there was so much to do. For instance, do laundry, mend socks, work on correspondence. Over the three months, the Ort boys were in the camp. The boys such as my father, Ernest Lovenberg, Hans and Gerd Futter, Bernard Pomeranz, Ziggy Reisner, Felix Burnell, Joachim Hirschstein, George Cohen, David Cohen, Max Abraham, Sidney Sadler, and Gerd Wolf developed their English skills by also doing odd jobs for the locals. They were struck at the kindness and warm welcome they received. The hours were long, the work was hard, but the weather was glorious, and for the first time in many years, they felt safe. Had they been simply lucky, or was it fate that they had got out of Germany in time? What if they had been born later in 23 or 24? They would have been on the second transport, not on the first. They would not have survived. Whatever the reasons, the Ort boys had been rescued, and it was the kindness of strangers that sustained them when their families no longer could. This fact, my father and his Ort school friends never forget and never forgot, and neither do their families today. Thank you. Friends, many of us will recall that the very first engagement that the newly elected mayor of London undertook only two or three days after his election was to attend the Yom HaShoah event at the Allianz Stadium in 2016. He participated in the pledge we then made to come together each year to mark Yom HaShoah, and he has honored that pledge by joining us each year since then. And we are in turn honored by his presence here today, and I now invite him to address us. <clears throat> we gather again here in Hyde Park, in the heart of our city, to remember the six million Jewish men, women, and children who were killed in the Holocaust alongside many other innocent people. Three years ago, I attended this commemoration event on my very first day in office as mayor. It's a day 
I'll never forget. It is crucial we listen to the deeply moving accounts of the Holocaust survivors, the stories of unimaginable emotional and physical pain they endured, and the incredible way they've lived their lives since. It's always an honor to be invited back to join you and to pay my respects. The theme of this year's ceremony is Remember Together, We Are One. Focusing attention on our common humanity is so important, particularly now, at a time when, as a nation, we're becoming increasingly polarized with the politics of blame and hatred seeping deeper into our national debates. In my view, this is one of the defining issues of the 21st century. And how we deal with it will have profound implications for the future we wish to build. Of course, we don't have all the answers yet, but I'm confident that one of the best ways of healing the wounds of division is to show how we can solve our problems by working together, not by blaming others. That's why we must strive to remember together, to come together and to work together, regardless of faith, background or race, to tackle hatred, anti-Semitism and extremism wherever we find it. Sadly, we know that anti-Semitism is on the rise once again. This can't be dismissed as a passing trend. We can't be complacent because we know from our history where anti-Semitism can lead if left to fester. So in these testing times, it's more important than ever that we all take moments like this to remember the horrors of the Holocaust. Let me end by saying this. One of the most effective ways of ensuring that future generations learn about the dangers of prejudice and hatred is through sharing the stories of the brave Holocaust survivors. Because despite all they've been through, despite all the suffering and turmoil in their lives, they've managed to contribute so much to society and to triumph over the darkest adversity. Not letting the evils they've experienced extinguish their hope or prevent them from seeking to create a better world for all humankind, a world where no one will ever have to go through what they endured. So I'd like to end by asking everyone who can to rise and show our appreciation for all the incredible survivors and refugees we have here today. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Please be seated. Friends, each year, although not everyone here will know it, Yom HaShoah makes a presentation to someone who's made a really significant co contribution to Holocaust education and or to the success of this event over a period of years. When this event has been held elsewhere, the presentation has been made behind the scenes. This year, there isn't really a behind the scenes, and we're marking all that one particular person has done for Holocaust education in general, and to this Yom HaShoah event in particular. And to make the presentation, I'd ask Jacques Weisser, himself a recipient of this presentation, to come forward and hand a certificate to Rabbi Barry Marcus, who has done so much for Holocaust education and for Yom HaShoah in particular, and who is so much more than just our chauffeur blower. The certificate reads, 
This Lifespan Award was made to Rabbi Barry Marcus, MBE, in recognition of his unique contribution to Holocaust education, commemoration, and remembrance in the United Kingdom through his many years of service to the Jewish community, particularly with Yom HaShoah UK and Yad Vashem UK. Friends, the words never again are often spoken in relation to the Holocaust, and they invoke a sentiment that is very far-reaching. Stephen Melzack, an international award-winning singer-songwriter, composed the song Never Again to inspire, educate, and commemorate Yom HaShoah and the Holocaust. Adapted by Yom HaShoah UK as its anthem, it is a rallying call to the next generation to remember. This year, we are joined by no less than five children's choirs to sing the song. While there are no words to describe these events, the voices of young children singing Never Again to an audience of many survivors and their families show that they, the children, are the future of the world and can stand up for what they know is right. I'd like to introduce the Wall Ilford JPS School, Sax Marasha, Claw Tikva, the Belsar Square Synagogue Junior Choir, and Naima JPS, together with our combined male voice choirs conducted by the composer, Stephen Melzak. We hope that the words never again not only echo in our hearts, but echo throughout the world. Stephen.
we stand here today to represent the youth of our community. We recognize that no matter how many words are written, how many testimonies given or images shown, we will never truly comprehend the enormity of the Shoah, a tragedy like no other in the history of our people. We stand here in unity with Jewish youth across the UK and throughout the world to promise that the six million victims of the Shoah will never be forgotten. We stand here to remember whole communities that were lost and a generation of Jewish children whose, whose laughter was silenced by death. We stand here today to honor every survivor and refugee, to acknowledge all that they have achieved and assure them that their legacy is secure in our hands. We stand here to honor those who made great sacrifices and risked their own lives in order to save the lives of others. We stand here in recognition of the impact the Shoah has had on our Jewish identity and on our community. Though we cannot change the past, we can shape the future by remembering. We stand here to pledge that the Shoah will have a permanent place in our community's memory and that we will come together each year on Yom Shoah to pay tribute to all its victims. No, no, no. Friends, today we have remembered the six million of our people who would have chosen life but were denied that choice by their murderers. And we remember them together because we are one. We have honored our survivors and refugees and reminded ourselves of the magnificent contributions that they have made and continue to make to our community and to wider British society because we are one. We have remembered together the heroes of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, together because we are one. And we have as one paid tribute to and remembered the many lost communities who live on because of our memories. And as one, we have listened to hitherto untold stories, which we should pass on to others. But let us remind ourselves, most importantly, that we remember all of those things in order to look to the future. The Shoah is behind us, but the Shoah lives on in us individually and together for a purpose. And that purpose is for us to fulfill our duty to the six million dead and to all the survivors and refugees to remember and honor their memory and to ensure that their lives are neither forgotten nor denied. Today has been very special and very emotional for us all, at a very challenging occasion. But there is another challenge for us all to take away with us today. And that is the challenge, once again, of fulfilling the final pledge you've just heard made in the youth commitment. So I ask each and every one of you here today to commit that the Shoah will have a permanent place in our personal and community's memory and that we will come together each year on Yam HaShoah to pay tribute to all its victims. Next year, we mark the 75th anniversary of the end of the Shoah, and Yom HaShoah UK is planning a large-scale stadium event in the early evening of Erev Yom HaShoah, Monday the 20th of April, to mark that anniversary. A major, a major legacy, legacy initiative is also planned, which begins today with the legacy cards that each of you has with your program to be distributed widely throughout the community. And this will run alongside and complement, as we heard, the very successful Maccabi Great Britain Yellow Candle Initiative, trying to remember an individual who died in the Shoah. By your presence here today, by repeating the pledge today, and by participating in our legacy initiative in the year to come, we will fulfill our duty to the dead and the still living to pass the flame of their resemblance, their remembrance on to future generations. In their name, we will never forget. And in that way, they will live on throughout the generations yet to come. We will now join with the choir in Oser Shalom.
conclude with Hatikva and the National Anthem, I want on your behalf to thank all those who made today's very special event happen. In your programs you will see a list of acknowledgements and I'm not going to take time up by reading them all out to you. Each individual, musician, choir, and we've been blessed with many wonderful choirs today, has contributed to this occasion and I say again on your behalf that I thank them but I will specifically refer you to the members of the organizing committee who've worked really hard to make today happen. You see their names 
Carol Hart, Matty Fruman, Jacques Weisser, and their chair, their chair, Neil Martin, and I want to thank them enormously. I want to thank the Community Security Trust, who are always there to protect and secure our community, our JLGB stewards, St. John's Ambulance, and the Royal Parks Authority, without whom this event could not have happened. And today I want to thank Liberty Drive, who provided the buggies in the park for disabled people. Please give them all a well-deserved round of applause. And now, please stand for Hatikva and the National Anthem. Thank you all for being here today. Please disperse as quickly as you can. I look forward to seeing you next year.